down and listen to records Smell the cover, read all the verses Tell me about your favorites on vinyl and vision Hey folks, uh, thank you for tuning in to the video. Um, if you're new here to the show, um, things are a little different due to the quarantine. We uh, we do our episodes, uh, we're doing most of them remotely now, which is uh, kind of a drag. You know, it takes away from the vinyl aspect of the show, that, that vinyl component where typically I'll have a guest come in here to the studio and we'll actually sit down with their copy of the vinyl record and put it down on the turntable and all that. So you can kind of see it and hear it, and uh, hence the uh, name of the show. But um, yeah, because of the remote recordings, I'm just not able to do that. Um, I try to show off my guests' records when I can, like this one. Uh, this is a uh, this is the the this is the uh, the Dove and Crow uh, copy of Marissa Nadler's For My Crimes, 2018 Sacred Bones release. Um, I also show off this album in the video a little bit during our interview. Uh, it's uh, 2019's Drone Flower, Miss Marissa Nadler with uh, Stephen Brodsky uh, of Cave-In. They uh, did a little release together, which is uh, really great. It's actually, uh, I mentioned how this is actually a really beautifully packaged piece of vinyl for those people that, are, that like them like the vinyl that is and um, the music is excellent as well it's uh, very much along the same lines of what you would come to expect from Marissa Nadler as a fan um, but it's just a just a really beautiful copy and um, so yeah so a little different with the remote thing with the remote recordings so um, that's what this episode is it's a remote remote conversation with uh, Marissa uh, through the computer, and uh, so we can't share the music virtually like that. So, uh, especially in the video, there is no music used whatsoever because I can't use it because YouTube is very, uh, very uh, strict about their uh, copyright laws. And if I use any of their music, they flag me, and I could potentially have my my channel shut down. So, um, so there's no music here. Sorry to say, if you care to listen to the audio stream on all the audio platforms, uh, the entire conversation will be there. It's actually a little over an hour long, whereas this video is just about uh, 40 minutes or something, somewhere around there, and, uh, and no music. So um, you can't hear us discussing the songs by Leonard Cohen from the album Songs from a Room, uh, whereas in the audio stream, I actually can put some of that music in there and you can kind of hear us discussing the songs uh, as as they play a little bit. So um, that's the way we normally do things, but like I said, it's a little different now. But uh, it's good and bad. So I'd like to say thank you for tuning in, thank you for watching, and uh, if you want to learn more about us, you can visit us at our website, www.psychicstatic.net. Uh, where you can also find merch of ours. So we have made some t-shirts for Psychic Static as well as uh, the show uh, Vinyl and Vision. We, uh, we were in a record store too. That's kind of how this whole thing came to be. And so there are some records listed up on that website. Uh, there's also a link on the website in the store to uh, an eBay page that we run because we have still been listing things there because it just moves faster and uh, that helps us. It's actually the, the way that we fund this show. So if you want to uh, purchase something through that website for, from the record store, by all means, please do so. Uh, follow the link otherwise, because that will take you to uh, a lot more things that we have. And I still have a ton more things that I have not listed yet, because it just takes a lot of time. Um, if you are looking for something, if you um, are interested in some vinyl, I have tons of 45s right now, actually. Um, ranging from all decades so if there's something that you're interested in feel free to you know send me a message through the website and uh and i will look for it i will see if i have it if i do i will definitely message you back and let you know uh how how to go about getting that i can either uh just do a direct paypal thing and i'll mail it to you for free or um i can tell you where it is already listed and you can find it there something like that um so, 
what we say here is uh, if you can do all the things you do with the internet, the likes, the shares, the subscribes, and of course the most important is the rating and reviewing. Um, wherever you do that, wherever you listen, wherever you watch, I would appreciate it. It helps us out a lot. It'll bring our numbers up and uh, that helps us get a little bit more exposure. Because uh, I hope to keep on doing this and keep on getting uh, more and more great guests that uh, that you would love to hear from as well. So do that. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, and enjoy the show. Um, yeah. So shall we start now, like officially? Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, uh, so well, let me start by saying uh, thanks for doing the, agreeing to do this and coming on with me. It's my pleasure. It's so nice to see you again. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah, you were at like my very first shows I ever played. I um, yeah, I think so. I'm not sure if I was at the very first one. Do you, what was the very first one? I don't know. Like, but you were at like the first few that right. I did, like um, at AS220 and I, stuff like that. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So your um, like your your music history, like. Um, you started out playing guitar, or did you play another instrument when you were young? Yeah, guitar is like, I, I quit piano lessons as a kid, so I um, learned guitar in like high school for my brother, older brother, oh, okay. and um, he taught me some finger picking techniques, but um, mostly just kind of developed from the age of like 15 or so. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. And so, um, when you learned how to play guitar, what, like, did you start a band or like, did you get into a band at all? Or? I did. I, um, had like a girl, a band with uh, some girlfriends in high school. We never even named it, but we did, um, uh, like, a David Bowie five years and so oh. and some other stuff. Like I was into more of a screamer back then. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. I did not take you for the screamer. Yeah, I haven't been able to do it in like something changed in me after high, like I just lost the ability to like scream, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. I just sometimes wish I could do that. I think it's like the reckless abandon of youth. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, you also, I mean, do you, like, when you did do that, when you sang that way back then, did you, did you feel like it hurt you? Did you feel like it was, like, kind of, like, uh, a little too strenuous for you? No, I remember it being easy. I don't know what happened, like, but mm. I just, I think my musical taste changed, like, um, from the grunge era, like, it changed over the years, and so right. my voice changed with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I definitely think that you found yourself. I mean, the, the music that you're making now, I mean, the way you sing, your style is is very, like, powerful and, like, gripping. And it's just, uh, just the way it's recorded just sounds great. Well, thank you. That's yeah. nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a very important thing as a musician to, to find, to know, like, know what your comfort levels are, right? To, to... Yeah, and to push them. Like, right now during quarantine, I've been learning the piano, like, for real. Oh, um, yeah. Like I'm taking lessons and learning to read music for real. So like, wow, that's been a huge, um, great thing that happened this oh. year, just because all this extra time, not being able to tour, um, I decided to, like, that was my dream instrument that I never got good at. So yeah, right, right now I'm getting jazzy and stuff. You know. Oh, that's cool. Well, yeah. I, I agree with you. I mean, if there's any instrument that I ever wish that I had learned as well, it would probably be the piano. Um, so what was your, so you mentioned how, how grunge, you know, I mean, obviously we're, we're about the same age. I think you're just a sh sh pair younger than me, but so the 90s was when you were a teenager and you were in grunge, you were getting, getting into grunge? Oh yeah, like, um, I was very into grunge. I mean, it was just uh, the the coolest thing ever to come home from school and watch Nir you know Nirvana on MTV like it was just a special era I think um, mm. if you, I was kind of an outcast not real I mean not like big time but definitely a loner in a 
kind of angsty. So that music did speak to me a lot. Yeah. So what were you yeah. listening to mostly? I mean, um, like what were some of the bands that you liked from that era? Well, I was a big Hole fan. Um, yeah. Actually, but just because, you know, for a certain girl in a certain town or it, it's I think she just uh, was so raw and that really spoke to me and my angstiness back then right. but, um, also still like I still would would defend her staunchly and her musical merits it's like I think she got kind of yokoed a little like yeah and but I love Nirvana too but uh, simultaneously I was listening to a lot of other types of musics. Um, like I got into Nina Simone really early. And mm -hmm. so got into a lot of singers like her and um, just eclectic music style taste, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's cool. So, um, so then what was, uh, considering the album that you chose for tonight was uh, Leonard Cohen's Songs from a Room, what uh, made you gravitate towards that? Because I know that you had a hard time deciding on something. Yeah, like I definitely don't have a favorite record. Like, oh yeah, like uh, it's so hard to even pick a like on any given day. I could pick a different one, um, but yeah. you know, I I love this record. I love um, this record for its its moodiness and um, right. kind of. I, was just listening to it to kind of freshen up my uh, recall of the names of the songs, but I was remembering how creepy it is. It's just kind of eerie. This was one of the first records that got me into the kind of music I started playing. Yeah. Like um, the finger picked hushness and focus on storytelling and. Uh, Right. Yeah, these these are some great stories. Oh yeah, for sure. So um, so when was your? Do you remember the first time you heard this album? And was this your first experience with Leonard Cohen? Funny enough, related to grunge, I discovered Leonard Cohen through that lyric in Penny Royal Teeth, oh, right. the Nirvana song, and I was like, "Who's that?" Because <laughs> we didn't have internet back then. Like, or I mean, I think I had basic AOL. Dialogue, right, dialogue. But, um, yeah. So I was curious. So I went to Borders Books and Music that mm. doesn't exist anymore, and got the cassette tape, like Leonard Cohen's first record, and then I loved it, and then got this one after. Oh, okay. The second one, um, and um, my mom at the same time turned me on to. Uh, like Joni Mitchell and because she was tired of hearing the like the grunge I yeah. think a little yeah yeah uh, now your your mother actually she was kind of more of a um, uh, she was an artist as well actually right she is yeah she's still painting and, oh I'm um, sorry yes she, oh yeah and she's she's just a great uh, you know she's great she's big creative inspiration yeah and so she, like, around the house with you growing up, she was listening to a lot of that, that uh, I guess, 60s-style music uh, in the vein of the yeah. singer-songwriters. Yeah, my parents were, like, not, well, they liked to rock, actually, a bit more, like, than that. Like, she, we had a lot of, like, prog rock growing up. Um, oh, okay. Like, Yes record covers mm -hmm. were, like, my earliest fi fan fiction, thanks to my brother, but, like... I think my first concert was Jethro Tull and Proko Harum at Greatwood. So oh, wow. they were like into like all kinds of music, but they definitely, they took us to the Grateful Dead concert. And, um, oh, wow. When they came on their Voodoo Lounge tour, that was and Neil Young. So yeah, they have that good taste in music. And I was lucky to like get introduced to Pink Floyd and Stevie Nicks at a young age. Oh, yeah. Like, as I said, I could have picked any Leonard Cohen record, really, but, like, or any, uh, another artist, too, but, um, this one has a few of my real favorite songs on it, like, mm -hmm. Lady Midnight, I actually used to play on, um, on stage in Providence, like, 20 years ago, um, 
It was Seems So Long Ago, Nancy, I think is my favorite song off the record. Uh, it's like the storytelling is very evocative. And, uh, yeah. This like sad woman with the gun beside her head, like the imagery just really kind of transfixed me when yeah. I first heard that. It was so eerie. Right, right. I don't know, there's the one song, what is it, The Story of Isaac? Which, I mean, I'm not really familiar with that story, but just hearing him sing about it is just, like, so creepy. It is. That's the one, like, the door it opens slowly, my father. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that song is so, yeah, they're pretty. And I mean, maybe it's, like, genetic memory for me in terms of gravitating towards these minor keys, but mm. I, like, really connect with the melodies on this on his songs funny enough i was doing research even though it seemed like i was ill prepared for this it was only because i didn't know i was on the video and the internet's forever so i've realized that the hard way oh that's okay Um, i'm sorry sorry for the surprise oh no it's okay it's a mere reason to like like you know slap on some lip gloss or whatever Mm -hmm. um but yeah the melodies to this record are awesome. I was researching for this interview mm-hmm. earlier because I really only knew the music and I didn't know the story behind it. And right. um, I didn't realize that it was recorded in Nashville, like right near where I am right now, um, oh. kind of like a school well, in Franklin, Tennessee, and that he had initially wanted to Initially, he started making the record with David Crosby, like in California. Right. I guess he scrapped it, and yeah. he ended up um, working with the famous producer. I'm forgetting his first name, but it's Johnston. His right. last name. Bob. Bob Johnston. Thank you. Yeah, and like who produced songs for Elvis and and discovered Bob Elvis. Dylan. Yep, and he did Nashville Skyline. Did he discover him? I think, uh, from what I saw, that says that he he was like, uh, yeah, I think, I think initially you signed Bob Dylan. Okay. I'll have to look into that. I may be wrong, but I think I that's what I saw. I know he definitely produced, uh, that's when he's talking to Bob in Nashville Skyline. That's like uh, him, and um, he produced that one. But like, I didn't know this that he did it in Tennessee, but it kind of makes sense because it's got this like, Americana vibe, not, I don't even know what that word means, but it's got like kind of a cowboy Western feel to it. Like yeah. the, um, loosely, I suppose. Yeah. Uh. That I came across a Rolling Stone review of this record from like 60, whatever year it was made, the late 60s. 69 um, is when it was released. Yeah. And the review was kind of scathing and it starts off and it would crack me up because like, he's kind of an untouchable now. Um, like, it never occurred to me that he would have gotten bad reviews, let alone this kind of review, which starts off like, he has a bad voice, which I don't agree with. Like, I find his voice very soothing. Oh, yeah. Like, and um, it just goes on to say that, like, the producer is the only good thing about this record. And, that like, it's the Rolling Stone review. And it was mm-hmm. really funny because I love when, rev- like, reviews that are... I love when reviews are proven wrong, like right. just music takes on a life of its own and nobody can deny like uh, the staying power of some of these songs. Like right. Bird on the, I mean, Bird on the Wire is not one of my favorite Leonard Cohen songs, but it's also like so, it's really infiltrated like the psyche of American songwriting for me. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's a great song. Uh, it was actually my introduction to Leonard Cohen. This is actually yeah. the first record I ever bought from Leonard Cohen. And I, I actually bought it mistakenly because I thought it was going to be the first record. Huh. Well, um, so you were mentioning, I just want to get into this just so I don't forget, uh, the Rolling Stone interview, the scathing review of this record. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually have it as well, and I was reading it. Um, but um, what was your experience been with uh, with critics? with your releases well like back you know it's actually been i've been lucky and 
back before they got rid of the comment sections on some of those blogs, like mm -hmm. I remember being just like devastated by some of the comments oh, and um, wow. it takes a lot of a really thick skin, which I've never a hundred percent developed in all honesty, but like, I just don't read that stuff anymore. Like I've been lucky that a lot of great writers have like written some nice things about me, but like, I also know that there's always going to be a neg like everybody's always going to have a negative review and mm -hmm. for art for artists especially it's just so important not to pay that like uh, any mind you can listen to it and take yeah like you can if they're constructive it can be helpful but right I'm definitely not a fan of like mean music writing like because I just don't feel like it's there's just not a place. To, or a need in the world for that kind of thing. Um, right. Cause most people release art with the intention of trying to make something, if not beautiful, then moving or visceral. Um, right. And so I, I am glad that like the there are no public comment sections on most of these blogs anymore. Um, just cause I know a lot of women musicians, especially that came up, around the same time that I did, mm -hmm. just being like, oh yeah, those were doozies. Like, cause a lot of it was anonymous. Like if people can write things anonymously. It's just kind of like, can leave a, a bad mark, I think. But right. I just try to stay busy. Cause if you believe in what you are making, that should be the only thing that really matters. I think. I agree with you a hundred percent. Well, I'm sorry that you had to experience that. I mean, um, you know, I only ask because it's a kind of a strange comparison uh, between you and Leonard Cohen as artists and uh, as uh, as people who you know release art for a living. Um, you know, because you've had a long career too. I mean, so you've been pre releasing records since 2004, right? Mm -hmm. So what, has it? Do you think that it at least has gotten better as far as like you know the uh, the criticisms that you receive and and the the press? What? As I said, like, I'm definitely not complaining. I've had a lot of good, re good, nice reviews and like, mm -hmm. that, and, and that's helped my career. But like, simultaneously, I have, like anybody else had like, I'm just the kind of person that I, like, you can say like a zillion nice things to me and one bad thing, and I'll just like fixate on the bad thing. And it's mm -hmm. like perfectionism, I guess. But like, yeah. of course, like, that's how most people work. Like, you, it's just like you only like hear the bad sometimes. But yeah. I just don't care anymore. Like, I'm. Good. I want to make if you know. I never really did, at, but like now I especially don't care. <laughs> yeah. Which is a great place to be. Like, I could care less because I know that like people have have like a loyal fan base to just keep coming back which is nice because um right. i'll i keep trying to grow yeah and, and i think that you things. are so i mean i think that you, you're right to not have not pay any attention to, to reviews and just focus on your work just for that reason because you do have a fan base and it is growing so that's all that really yeah. matters especially when you read something like i love like reading bad reviews of classic records it's just the funniest thing i think Black Sabbath, or no, Led Zeppelin got a lot of bad reviews. And I'm yeah. like, how could you, you know? Um, <laughs> so, yeah. I was going to say, maybe we should get into the record a little bit. Bird on a what? Wire is the first one. Yeah, I like that. I like that song. You know, Alec Redfern, he used to play that a lot. Oh, he did? On this accordion. And, like, when I used to see, like, shows around Providence, um, and... That was, he was really in a Leonard Cohen, so mm -hmm. I kind of got more into it. Um, but melodically, I really like, like, it's, I used to start getting into real flow on this record for me. Like, from track three, track four, track five, six, like, um, which is a bunch of lonesome heroes, like, which I just think is very, uh, it's very funny, like, we're... <laughs> Like, if you listen to the lyrics, um, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, a bunch of lonesome and very quarrelsome heroes were smoke, smoking out along the open road. The night was very dark and thick between them, each man beneath his ordinary load. Like, mm. just like nobody's, like, there's a reason why uh, his name comes up in great songwriting. Like, his, because I think he was one of the first people where I realized, like, the power of. Like, these don't seem like song lyrics. Like, you can read them. They stand on their own as poetry, which oh, yeah. I feel like most elements of music, or like, a, it's a good lesson to learn. Like, I want my lyrics to be able to stand on their own without a catchy melody. I, I agree with that. I mean, um, how, do you, how do you feel about that now? I mean, like, with some of, like, let's just use a, your newest record, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, for your crimes, which I have here, mm -hmm. which is a great record. I mean, um, I've listened to basically all of your albums uh, over mm -hmm. the course of one day. Um, oh gosh! <laughs> no, are you it was okay? Good. Are you okay? Are you, are you okay? <laughs> between between your catalog and the Leonard Cohen albums, yeah, I've been kind of feeling a little a little somber. But um, yeah. I don't actually. I don't find your music to be very depressing. I mean, it, it's it's somber, you know, it's definitely like kind of quiet and reserved and it's very uh, kind of, uh, it can be bleak at times, but realistically and overall, I just find it, uh, I don't know, it for, for me personally, I just feel very positive listening to it. And I don't know if that's just because I, I know you and, uh, or if it's just because of the, the content and, and the lyrics, but. Yeah. Well, that's nice to hear. Yeah, well, the new record like, especially. I think there is a lot of positivity in my writing that, like, that I get, I mean, I, you know, I get tagged with a lot of, like, doom and goth and death folk or whatever right. you want to call it. But, like, it's because my early records had a very high body count. And, um, <laughs> like, I just was yeah. like, super into murder ballads when I wrote that first record and everybody right. died in them. But, um, mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 this, like, last record definitely is stripped down production and focused on, you know, the lyrics. So, yeah, I'm one of those people I can't even, like, listen to it. I never listen to my own music. Like, right. it's just like you make it. I never want to hear it again or see it again. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right no, now, I'm, I'm going through that. Like, all my paintings are, like, facing the wall. I'm, like, frustrated. Like the album, like your album cover, this is one of your paintings. Yeah, that was like one of my early ones, so I think I've gotten be better s since then. But yeah. But anyway, that's like one style I I do. I mm. used to do a lot of portraits and stuff, but um. Right. This one's pr like seems so long. Da -da 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 -da. Nancy wore green stockings, and, mm. and she slept with everyone. And it, like the lyrics are really kind of evocative and I hadn't really heard that kind of thing before I got like these records hit me hard the first time I heard them I was like whoa yeah and I immediately understood the appeal of just satisfying for my versioning writing career or yeah um that's kind of he kind of he kind of made me gothy like I got darker and darker after discovering him um, could have been a lot of th reasons for that, but I yeah. kind of asso associate discovering him with my like obsession with learning how to finger pick, and um, mm -hmm. so he's an incredible guitar player, and nobody ever talks about that, but like mm -hmm. he does really great um, technique that I've never been able to really replicate, but really it's the like finger plucking class thing. It's classical, like he's playing a classical guitar, and it's just. This and a lot of them, the it's just a, everybody gets their own style. Right. Yeah, it's kind of like that kind of quick, repetitive uh, finger pattering, like finger patterns, um, almost like um, Devendra Banhar. Kind of mm -hmm. like that. Like his first few, few records is like kind of that quick, like it's almost like strumming, but it's finger picking. Like he's got such kind of quick finger work, you know. Yeah. Um, so to speak to the, the whole goth thing. Um, I did not know that uh, Leonard Cohen was kind of lovingly referred to as the godfather of gloom. Oh, I love that. 
<laughs> I've never heard that either, but it makes total sense because I, I really, I mean, you know, I picked this record, but as I said, this should just be more of like an LC appreciation podcast because mm -hmm. it's not like I love every song on this record. And like, I love the, the whole feeling of the record and I have my favorite songs on it. Um, yeah. Leonard Cohen has always seemed to me like a very old man. And half you of know, that... You know, he was pretty cute when he was younger, though. You got... Well, <laughs> um, yeah. so this is an interesting thing, is that, I, you know, I, he. it seems like he started his music career at the age of 33. So he was kind of like a late bloomer, really. He was already a renowned poet. Right. I think when he... You can't to put it to music, but I know he was the... Poet Laureate of Canada at one point. Um, yeah. And, but you know, it's never too late to start something new. I was, I think that's great that he was 33. I mean, I personally don't think you age out of being an artist and, or mm -hmm. even a performer. I, I love stories like that because I am really hoping that this piano thing like turns into like the, a whole nother wave of inspiration for me and that I have 20 more years with a totally different style and um, mm -hmm. like. Um, but yeah, this is one of my favorites as well, The Old Revolution. How do you? Yeah, I love the melody. Again, that, that they didn't really talk about that in the Mean Rolling Stone article, but they, they didn't mention anything positive about the melodies and I think that they're stunning. Sometimes mm -hmm. people just want a pretty icing on the cake or like, I know Bob Dylan got a lot of uh, criticism for his vocals early on, or people still make that joke. And right. I personally always liked Bob's voice. And if you can hit the notes, you can hit the notes, like right. characters, everything. Right, right. <laughs> It's just yeah. what notes are you trying to reach is the, is the question, I guess. And I think that maybe guess, yeah. that's what the, cri the critic probably doesn't realize is, is like he's, he's just not trying to sing out of his range. He's very comfortable in that range that he's in. And uh, I, I mean, I can sympathize with that because uh, that's one of the things I loved about this record when I first heard it. I was just like, oh, this guy isn't really a singer. And I like that because it's the same attraction to his vocal styling as, uh, as Lou Reed is for me because he's also like a very... He doesn't sound like a very trained singer. He's just very, very loose, and it's just kind of what they are comfortable with. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Like he definitely can carve out a good melody, and it's um, but it's that approachable delivery, mm -hmm. right. laid back. Yeah. Yeah, and it gives hope to a guy like me that can't sing. So. Um, I'm, I'm sure you can sing. <laughs> no, I, I I do a good Leonard Cohen. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Um, that's why I was envious when I heard you say that you used to do the screaming thing because I was just like, oh, that's something I wish I could do. Me too. I wish I could do it now. I don't know where it, where it went. Like, mm -hmm. I think I just need. To, I think it had to do with like being like a like like living in apartments my whole adult life mm -hmm. is what happened. Like the minute I got to college and I had like roommates, I got really. You know, uh, shy, like kind of too. Yeah, self. I think yeah. I'm even more shy, and then just wanted to like play and have nobody hear me. And I just, I think, got kind of even more introverted. Mm. But, but I came out of it like just took a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it turns out that uh, when he got into making music, he he first got noticed by um, by Judy Collins. And I guess she kind of like covered his song Suzanne and kind of made him a well-known name in the music industry and kind of like made him more sought after. She was like folk Midas, like she had the Midas touch mm -hmm. um, back then, I guess everything turned to gold or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, she was just so, so popular, I guess, and, and she just f managed to find these up and coming folk artists and hear the potential in their songs and, and you know, took a, an opportunity out of it. But so um, so one of his first performances was actually at her request. She uh, brought him up on stage with her to perform that song and to which he actually had a very uh, bad bit of stage fright. 
and walked off the stage. Oh yeah, I think I heard about this. Yeah. So it made me start to think about you. Uh, you, you we started off this conversation with you mentioning how uh, I, had, I was actually at some of your first few shows, and I was, and mm -hmm. one that stuck out to me was when something like that similarly happened to you. Uh -huh. Do you do you remember uh, that? Yeah. yeah, which one? Uh, we were at AS2. We <laughs> were at like AS2. There's a lot of them. I've had like, I definitely had my freakouts, but yeah, yeah. AS220. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like I was working the door, um, and you were playing. I don't remember what show it was. Like, I don't know who else was playing on that bill, but I remember kind of just sitting back and watching you, and just. Kind of out of nowhere, I thought I saw you just kind of storm out of the the building, and I didn't no, know no. where you went. <laughs> I do remember this. I I feel like there was a reason for it, though. I I don't um, know. I mean, that's what I'm asking you because I I don't know what happened. I, it was so long ago, but I'll tell you, I was dreadfully shy, and it, it was very hard for me to get up on stage um, yeah. during those years. Like I always. I might have had a panic attack, like which I used to have a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I do know. I had almost forgotten that. Thanks. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know I'm choking, but I had a lot of like bad. I mean, it's kind of amazing. I kept going. Just yeah. But you know, shyness fades away. The more I was lucky, I had good reviews and people championing my songwriting. So like that helped a little. But I didn't really get over the stage fright until like 2016. So like that's how many years of it? Twelve years into my career performing, right? That I could like kind of feel com <laughs> confident getting out there. You know? Yeah. So up up, up until 2016, you never you never had any other like uh, episodes like that. I'm sure I did. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've played so many shows like I know I, I told the crowd to shut up a TT the bear the the now defunct TT the bears in Boston but like hey that was like the only time I ever did it and I played like thousands of shows but like right. I definitely feel like I, I had a freak out at AS at South by Southwest in 2007 or mm -hmm. something because I just I think it's just like sensory issues like I like panic attacks you know yeah. like when like the, you're just like oh my god I can't do this and I'm gonna freak out and I want to hide and but I, I now I'm like a consummate professional and over that hump like I just have I can talk my way out of that right you know? it's second like nature <clears throat> to you now to walk out onto a stage well, no, but like, I have more faith in my skill set. Right. Well, yeah. Okay. I'm definitely not like a born performer. There's a big difference yeah. between a performer and a writer or an artist. They're not. Well, we'll go back to Lady Midnight for a second. Sure. Um, and this is my fa one of my favorite lyrics. The stars eat your body and the wind makes you cold. <laughs> it's so beautiful and it's just like, what are you fucking talking But I get, you know, I love it. Um, yeah. I love that there are actual conversations that are happening in the songs, like quotes, like he said, she said, and right. just, and I t I've been trying a bunch of different writing devices lately to, I'm kind of done with the confessional for a while. I'm just like, I don't want anybody to know anything about me anymore. <laughs> like, I, I feel like so exposed after the last record that I, yeah. right now, am writing like story songs and mm -hmm. really enjoying the freedom of writing stories is like, you can put yourself in them, which I think Leonard's in a lot of these songs that are about other people. Right. Just like a lot of painters, people say like Rembrandt just painted himself and all of his people. Uh, so do you feel like you're doing more research? Because like, um, like let's say going back to the uh, the last record that you put out for, for your crimes, that the title track 
is uh, a song written from the perspective of a person on, uh, on death row, correct? That was the initial, like, I asked uh, Ryan to give me an uh, um, idea about, like, I said, give me a writing prompt. And that was my prompt. And then um, immediately after writing the lyric, I realized the song had a lot of meanings. Like, oh, this just has to do with human guilt and imperfection of like, that nobody's perfect, that, uh, you know, it's about guilt and forgiveness, I guess. But I did use the storytelling to kind of put myself in like a corridor being like rolled down on a gurney or something or mm -hmm. just trying to visualize it to, yeah, it's just like a long metaphor, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Well, so do you think that that's where your songwriting will be going for like the next recording? I'm not sure yet. Like, I know that my next record needs to be different. Like, I'm done with a good, I'm not making another guitar record. So like, mm -hmm. I'm definitely going to do this record on other instruments and just got to try to challenge uh, a real metamorphosis. Okay. Cause there's gonna be so many songs. Like I've written a lot of heartbreak, lonely ballads. And um, this past week I did a songwriting camp with my publishing company and it was super fun like actually wrote songs for other people and also with other people yeah for assignments and i got to write my first r b songs and work with some just artists in way different genres than me and it was so much fun it's right. kind of like i imagine having like a few more side projects like i had that drone flower right record which is which I really liked doing and because I love ambient horror movie stuff <laughs> this here yeah that's it mm -hmm. yeah this is a, a great record as well and um, it's a very very sexy vinyl as well too like the clear with the black smoke yeah sacred bones is so great with their um, album design and the cohesiveness of the quality across the board yeah. Pretty. Very. I, I really love this. Um, I don't try to obsess about the vinyl specifically. The music is excellent as well. So Thanks. you do you mm -hmm. think that uh, there would be something in the future with Drone Flower or just another project? I think there'll be another Drone Flower. I think there'll also be several other side projects. And I want to do something with beats. Yeah. I want to do guitarless records. Like, I'm just like feeling like I've just com completed my early years or something. Sure. My, my outlook being like an artist career lifelong. So I was telling you how I listened to all of your albums in one day. And I, I started at the beginning because those are the records I actually were most, was most familiar with at the time, but I can definitely see a progression like from the very first record to your, your most recent is, um, as you're saying, it's just, it's definitely this just incline of like beginnings to like reaching this level of like really beautifully crafted songwriting, uh, as well as the production itself is just um, like these just beautiful sonic la landscapes for the most part. So oh, it, it's nice to hear that you are already, already considering where the next step should be. And, you know, taking obviously, um, you know motivation to to make that change and like you like i don't know it's just strange to think that, that you've, you've already thought about that that like you want to do something completely different i do for sure like i'm just you get tired of i got tired of playing guitar so i don't really pick it up as much as i sit down at the piano now mm -hmm. just because yeah just Kind of things come in phases so yeah well i'm looking forward to it i'm looking forward to see what you come up with next well thank you yeah um it's really nice to see you again it's nice to see you again too and can, can i ask you one thing before we go because I, I do you know i do know that it's not your time is precious and i don't want to take up your whole night 
But um, one of the most uh, recent recordings that you did was uh, Poison, which you worked with John Cale. Yeah, I, um, the producers that made my last record, uh, Justin Raisin and Lawrence Rothman were, J Justin pro is a producer that works, was working with John Cale. And basically, um, he heard that song and was like, dude, I'm going to ask John Cale to sing, to, to sing on this. And I was like, whatever, like. Justin's really funny and he's just like a ballsy dude. I yeah. was like, uh, whatever, it's never gonna, like, it just, I didn't actually get to meet John. He would just did it. And um, I heard it and I started crying. It was so beautiful. Like I, yeah. I was so freaked out. I, and um, thank you. Like I just was uh, really blown away that that happened. Very surreal. Yeah. And it made me feel and he really liked the song a lot too, and it meant a lot. Like, it's a really sad song. It is a little sad, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, but I don't know. I, I I thought it was a great song. I mean, I, I I actually geared towards sad songs, so I don't know. It's in my wheelhouse. It's what I like. Me too. <laughs> and so uh, again, thank you for doing this. It's great to see you. I, I hope to see you again in the real world at some point. Definitely will. Okay. All right. Have a good night. You too.